Greetings fellow mortals and welcome to my review of Expecting Someone Taller by Tom Holt, sometimes known as Thomas Holt and sometimes known as KJ Parker. This was Holt's debut novel, unless you count a collection of youthful poetry and whatever he did as a jobbing writer on the Lucia series and Expecting Somebody Taller or rather expecting someone taller, was first published in 1987. The plot follows Malcolm Fisher left behind when his family emigrated and generally poorly regarded or disregarded by those who notice his existence at all. Driving home one evening, Malcolm runs over a badger. The badger turns out to be the giant Ingolf in disguise, in disguise because he owns the Ring of the Nibelungs and the Tarnhelm, and these two mythical items convey a certain amount of magic power to the owner, but they also mark him as the king of the world. Ingolf is in disguise to ward off the usurpers, including the ring's original owner, Albrecht, and the king of gods, Wotan. The creation of the ring and the various intrigues around it are told in Wagner's opera, and Holt takes some of it as true and some not. But because our hero Fisher is a little bit on the dozy side, on becoming king of the world, Fisher's general amiability curbs the ring's desire to wreak havoc, and the world becomes a peaceful, prosperous place. Albrecht's attempts to get the ring back amount to nothing, and with Wotan lurking on the periphery, Fisher begins to mope around, considering his reign as the world's king has brought happiness to everyone but himself. Enter the Rhine daughter Flosshilda, who was initially intent on winning back the gold for her and her sisters, but finds herself drawn to Fisher, in part because he had asked the Tarnhelm to turn him into the likeness of the mythical hero Siegfried, apparently the world's handsomest man, after a good shave anyway. Complicating matters a touch is Linda Walker, hired by Fisher's housekeeper to catalogue the huge library he acquired when he purchased a stately home. Fisher initially claims to love Walker, despite her total absence of personality, because she is human. But he doesn't change his mind about her when he learns that she is the Valkyrie Ortlander, who has been sent by Wotan to trick him into loving her and giving her the ring. She will then give the ring to Wotan and he will rule the world, bringing a new regime that will be far more awful in ways and for reasons not specified beyond Fisher being, again, mostly a little bit dozy. Fisher is convinced that he can only prove his love to Ortlander by giving her the ring, like I said, dozy. But she's been so browbeaten by Wotan, though not in the text herself, as we will come to in a bit, she spends so much time looking down at her sensible shoes that she'd probably have sailed for the Bootins, and he can magic up as many as he needs. During this section of the book, there are a couple of moments where Fisher seems to be about to give the ring away, only to keep it, which have hints of what would inspire Tolkien to write The Lord of the Rings, but eventually he decides to keep it, sends Orlinda away and prompts an invasion of the mortal realm by Wotan and all the spirits of darkness. This comes to nothing when Fisher wishes them away and settles down to a gloomy, solitary life bringing happiness to the world. But apparently the Rhine daughters were not part of the mystical host that he banished so casually and Flosshilda returns, bearing the weight of carrying a happy ending. The plot, despite that lengthy summary, is not really the most important thing in a novel like this. What's important is that it can function as sufficient framework for some jokes and good humour to hang off. And expecting someone taller, for the most part, works really well. Some of this will have a universal appeal. On the very first page, for example, after hitting the badger, Malcolm is horrified by the damage done to his car, prompting the dying badger to inquire, how do you think I feel? There are three or four decent gags that land in the scene, a few wry turns of phrase, such as describing the badger's corpse as a dead zebra crossing, or his car's wiring as a confused chow mein. Not all the humour will travel around the world so universally, when considering the string of disasters that all turn to miracles on the first day and night of his reign, Fisher discovers he's not quite omnipotent when he's unable to turn around the fortunes of the England cricket team who were famously awful in this era. Though Aussie viewers old enough to remember 1987, good day to you, will appreciate that perhaps Fisher's magic was eventually capable of reaching down under after all. While Holt can never keep his politics completely out of the text, his commentary on the media gnashing and wailing over having nothing to write about has spent about 30 years on point by now. It leads to the brilliant headline as well of German farmers in rain horror after a rogue shower damages crops. Malcolm's success as king of the world prompts him to consider if perhaps the world is consistently failing because they keep asking brainy people to run it. 
his incompetence is some sort of unlikely qualification. Malcolm is initially really likeable, a slightly sub-everyman, dwarfed by his sister's considerable accomplishments and scorned by the sort of typically snobby parents you get in such, such circumstances, in fiction at least. He's nursing an inferiority complex that makes him a compassionate ruler and leaves him immune to the winsome smiles even of the Rhine daughters. Yet his relationship, if you can call it that, with the Valkyrie Ortlander is the first time that Holt really misfires. She's just hard work, so while the threat of him giving her the ring injects some intrigue into the plot for the first time, it's also the first time that this part of the story starts to drag a little. Floss Hilda, the Rhine daughter, has a fleeting build-up as a love interest, but she's then sidelined, and making jokes about Ortlinda's lack of personality doesn't disguise the fact that she doesn't have one, which not only makes Fisher look stupid for preferring her, but it's simple, really, that reading about boring people is best kept to a minimum. I really don't know if Holt was just trying to follow the plot of the original Ring of the Nibelungs or not, but this part of the story leads into Wotan's fleeting invasion, which is also pointless. The invasion is quite well written. You can almost feel the ride of the Valkyries booming away as they approach. It was over a thousand years since the hosts of Valhalla had ridden to war on the wings of the storm, and the world had forgotten how to be afraid. Like a vast cloud of locusts or a shower of arrows, they flew blotting out the light from the earth, baying like wolves to spur on the grim company that followed them, the terrible spirits of fear and discord. Behind the army, like a pack of hounds intoxicated by the chase, followed the wind and rain, lashing indiscriminately at friend and foe. And aside from this doubling of similes at the start, this is really pretty solid. The edits I've made here are mostly to just take out some of the lists of various gods or heroes, but this continues. But however vast and awesome this great force might seem, most terrible of all was Wotan, like a burning arrow at its head, as he flew headlong over the North Sea, the heat of his anger turned the waters to steam, and soon the forests of Scotland were blazing as brightly as Valhalla itself. As the army neared its goal, it seemed to concentrate into a cloud of tangible darkness, forcing its way through the air as it bore down like a meteor. There are perhaps three or four pages in this style, charting the scale and violent approach of Wotan's host, its pomp and majesty related with no little elan to the reader, and Fisher stepping out to meet them should feel like a moment of heroism or foolish bravado, perhaps even the inevitable yet supreme sacrifice. Instead, he waves the host away, and the moment is over, the setup rendered pointless. Wotan's failure was inevitable. Holt tells us in the early going that the ring can't be taken by force, and Wotan, though feared by Logi, is not really feared by anyone else. He's actually emasculated by his daughters, who are even extensions of his own will, and I'm not really sure what that says about a man. He's a really poor antagonist, passive, powerless, and even henpecked while mounting his steed for the final battle. His invasion isn't the only plot point waved away either. By assuming Siegfried's likeness, his musculature and strength, and then being revealed as his descendant, Fischer also waves away his position as a relatable everyman. It's an unnecessary contrivance that wins the approval of Mother Earth, which would have been better won by performing an act of bravery, wisdom, or selflessness. The final act of this novel just misses the mark for me, and it's a shame because the first half is nearly flawless. Rewriting Fisher's history for no real plot benefit erases the idea that anyone can rise to greatness, even those that are not particularly gifted if they put others first, as Fisher had been doing until Ortlander's arrival. Instead it becomes, you can do it if you're born to it, which is a far less pleasant idea. In conclusion, Tom Holt's novel has a verve and style that makes it a pleasant and fun read. The humour is quirky and wry, sometimes very British, and that might make it appeal to a fan of something like The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's not quite as effective as Terry Pratchett's early Discworld novels, but might sit more comfortably in his later output. It has that same sort of cynical eye, and perhaps turning up the satire and down the myth appear might have allowed for more to be made of that final act. While Fisher's identity as the descendant of Siegfried is foreshadowed early on, it's still a disappointment when it comes. Fisher is an amiable halfway, it's easy to root for him, and he even survives the discarding of Flosshilda for Orlinda relatively unscathed, until their relationship drags on and sucks the life out of the drama that surrounds him giving up the ring or not. Holt, even in his debut novel, should have had the courage to step further away from the mythic and operatic inspiration, if that is indeed what he's doing, and do something else with his final act. The more I think about which, the more I dislike it, and there's a danger there in forgetting how much I loved the first one, perhaps even two. Expecting Someone Taller is genuinely good fun and recommended. If you like this sort of thing, like and subscribe for more. Floss Hilda stood and watched a seagull trying unsuccessfully to catch and eat an abandoned tyre. 
She knew how it felt, in a way, and out of pure sympathy, she smiled at the tire, which turned itself helpfully into a fish. The seagull, who had known all along that persistence overcomes all obstacles, devoured it thankfully, which was hard luck on the fish, but nice for the seagull. It would have been nice if this message had continued longer into Malcolm Fisher's story, but who doesn't like to see a seagull getting what it wants? Thanks for watching. See you in the next one.